organized coming about the next few days. Uh, today, uh, it will be uh, short to say a few words, then Professor uh, Ute uh, will say something as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we get to uh, Professor uh, Issa uh, keynote. Uh, after the keynote, we will have a coffee break. Uh, and after the coffee break, there's a film to me. Uh, it's not a movie. And after the movie, uh, seven thirty, we booked a celebration of Lula Victory <laughs> <laughs> at uh, restaurant Cocaio. Well known restaurant. And I don't know how which budget put them but I don't think by everybody and among some. so this is for today. Tomorrow we we'll get back on track again, eight thirty we start. We have a quite a bit compact uh, program. The program is in the in your satchel in your bag. And um, it, every day there will be a screening. Uh, I'm a shifty movie of this screen of some kind. Of <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was, he, he's late, but he's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, the, the, the program is, is quite um, from back. This is a, a book focused uh, uh, symbolism. Uh, that is to say that we hope to be able to produce enough stuff to, uh, to produce a good uh, edited volume. Um, perhaps you can, for soon that can mention something. There will be there is a there is a new uh, uh, book series with with real. This is a possible candidate, which is open source, uh, uh, for free online, uh, and. Um, um, they, this workshop, they, this symposium finishes on the fourth, on the third, and then from the fourth to the twelfth, uh, part of us will stay on. Uh, we will continue with the doctoral school of factor of ideas, which is of a different format. It's, it's indeed for graduate students, uh, and uh, but that is to say that this discussion on biography and the politics of biography and heritage will go on. Okay, now. Uh, but I find this is a of paper. Uh, as most of you know, this symposium is the result of a project started approximately one year, one year and a half before the pandemic. It was meant to take place in 2019, 2020. Uh, and um, the application was, uh, we tried several, several sources and so forth. But the end of the world that was off because of the pandemic. And, and, and the drama that it meant for many of us. The, um, uh, as uh, the whole thing got started uh, out, of, out of an idea that I had doing research on Eduardo Shivambo Mondana, which I will be speaking here in my, uh, that it was, could have been interesting uh, to, to reconceive of, of this particular biography or trajectory. Uh, as a topic to be researched, not only by long reader, by, by a single person, on a, um, ethnographic finale, uh, but as, as a collective project. Uh, a collective project very much in line with the book in some of your literature we launched, uh, organized, the collective group organized by Issa on the later. Uh, uh, we are more and more convinced that biographies need to be. Um, Big biographies, small biographies, but biographies that matter from understanding the social history of the country need to be um, uh, studied and based and, 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 and uh, analyzed through a variety of, of, of perspectives. I can't read my writing, especially for the last two days. But, uh, and that, that um, let's give me a second. That, that, that perhaps, especially in Africa, but not only in Africa, 
That's why we have Subhaz and China from India. Uh, and we would like to have more people from other, from other countries, particular countries with the colonial experience, uh, in decisions. So much to be learned by this possible South African thing. Uh, that um, a collaborative and interactive project uh, would have been something very much in line with so many, so many specialists say and argue about, about biographies. I'm not a specialist about that. I'm an ethnographer. I bumped into my own biography doing research or something else. And I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm a learner. Uh, I'm not, and there are among us people that uh, master, masterly uh, worked out papers on, on biography that the point of biography we can learn from them. All in is wonderful. Um, but I think that I, I firmly believe that in, specifically when we deal with the biography, of people that have battered a lot to a country. This is certainly the case of Mobad, uh, Gandhi, the, you know, the father of the nation, the mother of the nation, unfortunately, most of their fathers of the country. Uh, that these are so politically laden uh, biographies and people that multiple perspectives, it's a disciplinary approach. And that's why we have this partnership with Uta, uh, who comes from a completely different perspective. Professor Uta Fender, she comes from uh, literature. Uh, uh, film studies, uh, very different to my anthropology uh, backing, but it's extremely interesting the way we, we can learn from one another. Um, and that the full, um, in this room, we have a mixture of people. Uh, and uh, I soon had the impression that uh, in the case of Molani, that can be applied to almost anybody, uh, his life was a part of, part of a larger. Uh, and that sometimes you need to, in doing a, a writing and biography, um, trying to do that, uh, it's, it's a matter of being able to zoom in and zoom out, huh? being able to do and get into the small details of life, like anthropology like to do, but also being able to contextualize. You know? And it's, it's easy to say, zoom in, zoom out, it's like a camera, but it's, it, it's difficult to do it. It's often you need different skills, different perspectives. Uh, being able to speak several languages, analyze transnational connections, operate across different archives in many languages is not for everybody. Uh, and, it's, and it's difficult, you know? uh, particularly in this world where, which is deglobalizing, where visas are difficult, uh, traveling has become difficult again. One of the things that has occurred in the last few years is that borders have become more important uh, with the pandemics than it used to be. And arranging these as I was up is a pain in the neck, but use another more poetical expression. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we've managed here, thank God, for everybody. But it's been, you know, it's consumed half of my energy uh, getting these together. So also, I uh, could conclude, I think that what's, what's come to, to, to my mind, and hopefully what comes to our mind, is, is the, uh, the, the comparative perspective. Of, of these leaders, uh, whether masculine or feminine leaders of the countries, and it would be interesting. Because in many ways, as much as nationalism, national leaders, uh, I don't say that they're the repping of one another, but they, they, in order to be a national leader, you need to have certain characteristics that are similar to national leaders. That is not the way you present yourself. You always present yourself as a singular leader. But leaders are similar. And, and, and therefore, and also there, Perhaps a comparative transnational international perspective uh, of biographies uh, uh, could, be, could be something that, would, that I hope is impossible. Uh, this is what the symposium stands for comparative perspective, as well as an interdisciplinary and transnational perspective. Um, and now to finish with the local part of myself doing research on heritage and memory. Uh, uh, shows that the tenets of uh, heritage, biography, and, uh, are often catchwords uh, that, uh, that are very powerful global items, but they, they, are, they are very specific uh, local meanings. So we have global items huh? and then local meanings. Um, just be um, doing research on memory in uh, an organizing symposium in a, in, a, in a hotel, which is in between the Avenida Mirka Cabral, Avenida Vladimir Lenini, uh, it's already uh, revealing of a specific Mozambican context uh, in which we have to then quote uh, and, and that, that 
imposes uh, limits and offers opportunities. Uh, so uh, that is to say, not uh, the, the biographical way this is coming across uh, most African countries, uh, certain some of the countries that are here, uh, represent the yes, South Africa um, and, uh, and uh, uh, many other countries in Africa. Uh, show this this universal characteristic, but also very low specificity. And in, for instance, if we, if we put against each other South Africa with a very established heritage uh, setup, uh, infrastructure, and Mozambique with a very weak infrastructure in terms of archives, museum, it's an interesting, interesting kind of comparison. Um, so, uh, Things have changed after the pandemics, also the way we organize symposium. Also for this reason, this symposium is a hybrid symposium. Uh, a number of colleagues uh, couldn't come. Uh, three of them got, got health problems. Uh, Siraj, uh, Peter Simate, and yesterday Antonio Tomas. Uh, nothing serious, all of them, uh, they're all alive and kicking, but they're, they, they can travel, so they will participate in the line. Uh, and Jocelyn Alexander, uh, she was uh, in position to travel the same place as this in Macau. Uh, Severino Gueno was in Italy, let's get a ring that is back, so it will be in present. So it will be an hybrid, hybrid uh, event. And um, I need to finish uh, by, by uh, thanking the institution that made this possible. Uh, my home institution that allowed me to stay here for a while, the of the year, and my graduate program, represented here by, by uh, uh, three colleagues, uh, Patricia, Zamparoni, and Fabio, and there are four students about coming tomorrow. Um, they decided to travel late because they wanted to vote. <laughs> so we, 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 we and uh, uh, and last, uh, Africa Mountain, a very viral. Uh, which has been essential for the, for the, for the concretizing of such a thing that we have been, been dreaming for a while, and about which Ute uh, will speak in a while. Uh, I, I, uh, I absolutely uh, can't uh, make me to emphasize uh, how important it has been to, to be able to work with a good team. Carlos Fernandez, uh, better known as Lito, uh, you, you, know, you know him. Uh, 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 there. Thank you so much. Both in the Center of African Studies at the Eduardo Mondani University. Vera Gasparetto, down there. Rio Grande School in Brazil, but here as a postdoc uh, for still a few months. And, um, uh, and to all my friends that are here in the room, because without their patience, uh, Others because they take me up at home, Pauline and many others, <laughs> or they tolerate me in, the, uh, in, my, in my daydreaming, but these here, the Patricias. And so mm -hmm. thank you so much. I can name all of you, but uh, without your friendship. Uh, so it's a mixture of, of friendship, uh, funding, uh, perhaps a good idea. Yes. These all things have to be present in order to other us and projects. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, but you know, when we put in YouTube, there is subtitle. There is a, uh, the, there is a uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it can't happen. And uh, if the fact about YouTube produces the subtitles that are quite good, so uh. <laughs> okay, good evening, Ms. Wakanda. Um, due to the pandemic, my, my Portuguese was good. I mean, I don't know why they have to speak Portuguese, so, and if there's something to do, they don't speak any Portuguese. Okay, I'm very happy to be in Maputo again. I'm also very happy to see a lot of things in a long time. And then I could co organize, I mean, it's the main organizer of the company, Lipio, in this important project. 
You asked me to say a couple of words about African Martyrs. Everything is online, there's no information. Um, it was a competition in 2018 that won in Germany, the, what they call the Excellence in Strategy uh, in Germany, which allowed us to have funding for seven years, which is enormous. Uh, it doesn't happen so often. And in this project, we also have four centers on the continent. There's one uh, at the University of Bogadu, uh, one at the University of Lagos, uh, one at Moy uh, University in Kenya, uh, and one in Makanda University. Um, and our privileged partner, as they call it, is um, is Salvador uh, Dubayo. So this is why we also work together and allow people to travel back and forth to get different to different places. Um, so there are also representatives two at least from our from the ACC, the African Justice Center at George University, the professor and Sergio Sindo, who is a part of a member of the cluster and also a student this year, and also from the ACC Labs, they have two students and another one from Moy University. So I'm very happy to bring you all together. And as you know, four from Salvador are joining tomorrow. And I hope, I mean it's very unfortunate that we have to be here at the hotel and the campus. But I really hope that it will be open for students and colleagues and those who are interested in, in, in discussions. So maybe coming days this can be opened up for other people, those who are interested. Um yeah, just so every multiple is a very they're only like it's about every multiple reconfiguring African studies. And the main concepts, like very large ones, multiplicity, relationality, and flexibility. And under this, there are about 40 projects running in Bayreuth, and another, I think, another 40, 50 projects at the other four centers. So it's a very diverse and very multiple structure that should enable different corporations in different directions. Some of the partner universities of Texas, the the doctoral school that the first colleagues from the hospital might remember that we had some activities before the pandemic. And hopefully, we, will, we can relaunch that exchange between the Blood and Land um, and the Center of African Studies with the University of Bayreuth, but maybe then also with the larger social rights network. That would be, I, I hope that this symposium, in a certain way, might also enable us to reconnect certain lines that have been there. So that we could maybe then develop for the, for the future. But anyway, I think you have thrown, but you will get this at least, and now you will see the, the, the link on the website, Africa Multiple, and then you can find a lot of information if you're interested on the structures, the different research um, structures. Yeah, what could be interesting is that also fellowships uh, at the different centers, so not just in the but at different centers. Um, and uh, of course, also for doctoral students, qualified for some interest, and also for artists and residents, um, just to intensify also the transdisciplinary work in the different directions. So I hope this is enough for African Martin, because maybe for the symposium, but not for African Martin. It is about this for the table. Before I give the question to Professor Sanchezi, uh, I need to point out an interesting step. This is symposium was meant to take place at university. The university is passing through a rough moment in terms of trade union agitation, uh, reconfiguring of the university. So we have to move out of the university. This is luckily is only for a few days. So the doctoral school will take place at the university uh, and it's open. But anyway, we decided to be uh, fully uh, available uh, online. So we, just, we circulated the, uh, the uh, Zoom link and it's on YouTube. And I show you to this more democratic uh, Zoom. So uh, and we stay on and this is the way we have to, to be open. It's not the ideal solution, but by the way, I apologize for the, for the, for the relative uh, precariousness of our facility, but this is the way we put it up. Professor Issa Shirji, please.
not like this person, but can I take the you take my you take that's that's your yeah. <laughs> uh, there is an expression in Portuguese that is ridiculous. In the space of the self, <laughs> <laughs> it does help the self to be of course uh although uh i wish you that with people who know it much better we could have uh, see the better from the presenting because isa isa is uh is is, is a changing is uh is is the uh <laughs> no, no it's okay that's, that's my comments uh, <laughs> Professor is changing from Dar es Salaam. Uh, is uh, is is got multiple training, certainly in history and law. Uh, formally is uh, in law, if you told me. Uh, but he's well known to both people who work in law and people who work in history. Uh, all this part of Africa, not only Tanzania, eh? because of the project he's been involved in. Um, recently. Uh, it comes from the old, uh, it's, it's been one of the young agitators, as it's only of the, of the, of the old Dar es Salaam School of History, uh, part of the student movement in the years that many of us correspond also to the period of the Berlin, my research from Mozart, second part of the 60s, when Dar es Salaam was uh, still is a beautiful place, but was a pan African capital, perhaps the pan African capital. So it has had an amazing uh, first one experience. And has been reflecting on that. He's produced a book of which, about which uh, I would not be speaking because it's launched at the, at the conclusion of our work. And yet, it gives uh, and deserves to give uh, the keynote to open us the both. Thank you. While I love flowers, I don't want to. Can I take a obstacle? I do. Uh, <laughs> friends, colleagues, and comrades, of course, one could start with a cliche of painting, but in this case, it's very sincere. I really want to thank Livio and his team. for three main reasons. One, for organizing the symposium with an unusual topic. And uh, it's very attractive. Yesterday I was talking to your friend on WhatsApp from Tanzania. She asked me what symposium was I me and explained, oh, that sounds very interesting. That's how I get it when you first get me out. Two, for bringing us out of the couple of years of pandemic, where you are told distance, social. I imagine telling people who are used to social solidarity, distance, social. Is very painful. And several conferences, symposia, which are organized on Zoom, they could never give you satisfaction that you get when you have in person symposia like that. There are no breakfasts <laughs> where you talk incessantly, interact. Have heated debates. Okay. And in the evenings, as my friend left someone want to say, we will all gather to drink and solve Africa's problems. <laughs> <laughs> That's that is spread. You could not get that on Zoom. You could not get that on Zoom. So with this opportunity, I jumped on it. And Thirdly, you, you, you made it possible for me to meet some of my old comrades, some of whom I had met before, others I knew them by name, I hadn't met, 
And secondly, and more important, also to make new comrades and friends. For me, I think that was a great, great opportunity that was lost. So once again, I would like to say to him, you and Carlos, Carlos spent half a day with you two and <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> Just uh, making sure that you don't appear here, you know, on their chairs. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, as I expected, very warm welcome to Mozambique. You know, Tanzanians have a very soft heart. We had long relations. Samara was family friend of Molinera. And there were very few times that uh, you have seen Mali Munyare weeping in public. One of the times was when he attended Samora's funeral. Okay. Uh, with those few words, let me go into the task that we are doing. That we are doing. And uh, I tried very hard to make it a king, not a pet. <laughs> so, 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 those of you who are looking for a long paper with uh, all footnotes and so on will not find it. <laughs> Julius Kambaraginere, or as we fondly call him, Moimiere, does not require much introduction, but still. Let me say that for half a century, he was the towering figure of Tanganyika and then Tanzanian politics. He was almost a crusader of African Europe. You find some people, friends, in Mozambique, even in South Africa, in Israel, the that Israel when they were in Tanzania during the liberation study. And Malimu's commitment to the liberation of Africa was unresolved and consistent. On that, he never, never went back. Also, Malimu is known to head our independence movement. And we in Tanganyika, for various reasons, but also the leadership of Malimu, got our independence remarkably peaceful, peaceful man. And we were the first country in Africa <coughs> which united Zanzibar. In many ways, when you look back, but, and particularly academics and researchers like us, and situated, it was
global south statesman and uh, you can witness them in the south commission report which he headed where he put into practice his uh, beloved theory of self-reliance in this case collective self-reliance so that was one of and this was the man we embark on to write a biography of. Not an easy task, a daring decision, very ambitious. When Malibu was still alive, I used to joke that I would like to write Malibu's biography. And at that time, the level that Malibu used to attract was philosophical, philosophical, philosophical king. I said only when he has stepped down from his kingship, and he means a philosopher, that's when I write his biography. It came to pass, but after his, his, his death. In writing this biography, you face several challenges. And I want to share this with you because it is important for us to share our experiences in doing work like this. This intellectual work, however you may think, is individual, it's not individual, it's correct. It is correct. The first challenge was that. It is very unusual circumstance that three people writing a biography of Sinisa. I have not seen that. Usually you get one person to write a biography of one subject. Maybe there exists, I don't know, but I haven't seen it. So three people writing biography. Now, these three persons came from different intellectual backgrounds and traditions. They came from different disciplines. One was trained as a linguist, another as a political scientist, and third one as a lawyer. Usually biographies, in my opinion, written by journals, not, not historians, I'll say a few words. Usually it's journalists. Write biographies. So we came from different intellectual backgrounds. That itself made us somewhat diffident and we had to overcome that. Fortunately, we came from the same university and from the same tradition of interdisciplinary discussions, debates that you mentioned in the 60s and 70s. So we came from that background. So interdisciplinary work was not foreign to us. And that hurt. The second thing which hurt us was that all three of us admired volume. Although one of us was known to be critic of volume here at Wendy's. And to my pleasant surprise, that did not become an obstacle. So we embarked on this project. The other challenge was that we are writing a biography. If a person who is highly respected in his country elsewhere, to the extent that some of the church people want to give him a sanctuary, I'm sure he would have, he would have totally refused. 
Now, to write a critical biograph, an analytical biograph of such a person is not easy. Because you may end up treading on toes. And I'm glad to report that actually, I think we did well. That <laughs> occasionally I helps to petrol things. <laughs> And uh, so far, even in Tanzania, we have not received anything on, on that score. Including in volume one, we discuss, we spend quite a bit of time, the whole question of Malimu's relations with women. We have to couch it in, in a language, but still not produce inequities. Not gloss over. <clears throat> At the outset, we agreed on three questions of how we approach and what kind of methodology we use. One was we agreed that we wanted to write a biograph, not a hagiography, right? That's the pronunciation. Not a hagiography. We did not want to write a eulogy of Malim. It's not like this. We wanted to write a critical biography, a critical and analytical biography. That's one. Second, we agreed that we will not shy away. From criticizing the criticism was due and could be supported. The other thing was that we had in our making a political critique of Malin, we ran the risk of being identified by people from the right to a demonized Malim. He's making a comeback. But after he stepped down for 10 to 15 years, all over the world, particularly in the Western press and so on, Malim was demonized. His policy of failed, et cetera, et cetera, all that stuff. So how do you write a critical biography and don't get identified with that trend, you have to tread very carefully. Because our critique was from the left, not from the right. Our critique was meant to show certain things historically without taking away the credentials of Malim as a progressive nationalist, as a pro-people leader, as an anti imperialist And again, I'm glad to say, I think we succeeded in that. But then you never know, because even a devil can quote a Bible, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but so far, we have, we have, we have not seen it. The other issue that we agreed on, that we wanted to tell, not only tell the story of the man, but in telling the story of the man, we wanted to tell the history of his name. At least a political history of his name. So you're not simply telling the story of a great man, a great woman, where biographies are written. But through telling the story of this man, we are telling the story of his country. Later on, I'll make a comment or two on that, how important and useful that task is. But in this day and age, when a younger generation do not read serious works of history, and if you access them, how can you tell them 
impart history to them through this other mode. Thirdly, and this is the most one to reach. We agreed at the beginning in our discussions with few others that our theoretical framework and methodology would be what we call historical materials. I said we agreed. But at the beginning, this agreement was in the abstract. This agreement was on in the abstract. We do not know what we were saying. And if you knew, we probably pushed it to our subconscious because we did not want to make this right at the outset to wreck the project. But the truth is that our understanding of historical materialism as a method was very uneven and in many cases even different, or in some cases even non-existent, right? We agree. We will use that method. And when we began, when the lead researcher drafted the chapter outline and we discussed, we agreed on it and so on, and then the same chapters, our understanding, our, 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 our plan, so to speak, was that each one of us will draft the assigned chapter, then we all discuss it together. And when we have finished writing our chapters, one among us to synchronize these chapters, the language, theoretical consistency, etc. etc. This is how we get it. This is honest, this is how we get it. When the first draft of the chapters came in, we read it. That would not be possible. <laughs> <laughs> that would not be. Possible. If if we have paid the student, we paid, he would have given up. Say, oh my God, I started with this hypothesis and now it shows I can, there's no way I can show it. I can prove it to the school. That's not possible. As I said, our, our understanding was extremely uneven. You could say you write language, but how do you synchronize your theoretical approach? Right? How do you do it? Now, as you know, as writers, you know, that we divide our books into parts, part one, part two, part two. very common division, right? Usually. Now, you could not divide the book into parts and then say each part, this part has been written by X, Y, Z, this part has been written by ABC. You couldn't do that. So we hit on the idea of books. In ancient times, Publications were not divided into parts. They were divided into books, book one, book two, book three, and so on. So it hit on that idea. Okay? It's a subaltern way of doing it, you know. What was buried, now we got it back. So we agreed that each one of us was responsible for his or her book, okay, and all up to it. So to speak. of course we discussed it together. We comment, but ultimate responsibility what you are, the author who had written that book. Hence, you find these three words. Book one is written by Said Ayaya Osman. Book two is written by Wanza Kamata. And book three is written by Isashi. You find these three books. And they're not called volumes, because volumes are usually the same author, right? Volume one. They're called books. You notice that they are called books. And we were foolhardy to promise in our preface book four. Uh, because book one, book two, and book three deal largely with domestic issues. Book four will be on African liberation and African unity. Pan-Africanism. 
And of course, now we, we could keep us. <laughs> After we had finished this work, which was in 2020, March, the pandemic was still. Of course, immediately we did not even go into discuss with thought. Although in collecting materials, we had collected material. You know, we probably, I don't know whether this will be true of my colleagues, the co-authors, but we went into some kind of a writer's vlog, so to speak. You know what happens? When you, when you return something, you set a certain standard, you raise expectations. So the writing that follows, people expect that you will stay by your standards that you had set. And there is this fear. You will be able to maintain that. I'm told, I don't know, some of you may know the famous novelist called Arundhati Roy. After Arundhati Roy wrote her first novel, God of Little Things, she did not write second novel until 12 years later. And the reason was the same. She could not come paying herself, but we I be able to reach that standard for the first novel, the way to do so. But we have decided now, next year, we are beginning to embark on the project writing before. And if you do not make manage, then you should blame Colin Dutch for it. Because Colin Dutch has promised to find us <laughs> the correspondence between Kruma and Yere from Pan which is very crucial to move forward. But don't worry, I think we'll collect the time fine. That, that will be nice. So that, that's that's the plan for 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 this. We already have a chapter outline, we will sign the chapters and so on. And once again, you have not yet discussed how we will deal with it, but that is it. Now let me at this then do a little digression. On this method that I've called method of historical material. And again, I'm sharing this with you because, as I said, in embarking on these projects that we were talking about, maybe, maybe this could be considered one of the methods of writing biology. In my view, There are two major elements of historical materials which are very important to guide and to provide a theoretical framework for writing in biography. One is the perpetual questions the historians keep asking on the role of individual in history. The role of individual in history. Now, those of us who come from the Marxist tradition, of course, are familiar with the way Marx where, where did Marx look at the role of individuals? Remember the famous quote in 18 Rumer, where he says that man make his man, of course patriarchal language, men make history, but not in the circumstances chosen by them, but in the circumstances given to them. But within those circumstances, they make history. That's the first thing. And then, to the end of the 19th century, there is a very interesting writing publication by Pekano, George Pekano. Pekano. On the role of individual history. Where the kind of gives three factors or three causes. Which one is the traditional Marxist one about the development of productive forces. 
Okay. Now the productive forces that are reflected in conditions of production. That's a general force, as the kind of force. The second is what we call the particular force, which arises from the history and culture of a particular place or country or nation. And the third is the individual force, where the character, talents, idiosyncrasies, outlooks of the individual comes in. So these are the three causes it identifies, the kind of identity. Of course, his first cause of to force is quite in very traditional terms. There's lots of development in Marxism about that. The product was not simply an objective development of technology, etc. But it's more than that expression of the role of producers themselves, their consciousness, their stage of struggle, so on. <coughs> so this was our, our, our guide. about historical materials. The second element of historical materials, and this I kept emphasizing, <laughs> is first, let me say what historical materialism is not. Historical materialism does not mean situating a particular phenomenon, etc., in historical context which is a common way of being, okay? It's important, but that's not what historical materialism. Second, historical materialism is not relating the event to historical process. It's important, but that's not historical. Or the other way is to find the cause of a particular event in a particular history. Or a particular materiality in a very mechanistic fashion. Because that's not historical. In my view, in my view, historical materialism means events, actions, and actors are located and situated in social struggles in the country or in the place we're writing. Class struggles and historical materialism. And this method we summarized in our preface. I've given the report for you when you read the paragraph you read it, where we say in a report our biography of Gerere is grounded in the history of people's struggles, in which Gerere the man was immersed and from which his greatness emerged. <clears throat> Our narrative does not shy away from recounting contours surrounding Yarer the man or providing a reasoned critique, occasionally severe, of Yarer the politician. All this does not detract from his greatness. Controversies and critics constitute the stuff of which great men and women of history are men. While fully acknowledging that men make history within the circumstance, circumstance they encounter, we also recognize that men of vision and talent play a critical role in shaping the strategic tones that history takes. Just as without the Swan Nature, there could not have been a San Domingo Haitian Revolution. Or without Lenin, there could not have been the Russian Revolution. So too, without Yarere, Tanzanian nationalism would not have taken a socialist path. And just as Lenin 
who don't sell the Russian Revolution from being bureaucratized in the Stalin, so to Yerere, could not save Tanzania's nationalism from being neoliberalized neo under his success. End of quote. So, as I said, we overcome, we overcome these challenges, and this is a method we have intended to apply. Now, I leave it to the readers to decide how far we succeeded in applying this method for, 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 for you to judge. But I do believe that historical materialist method helped us to identify critical conjunctures in the political history of the country when Nyerere faced choices. When Nyerere faced choices. The fact that he chose one path instead of another could be attributed at least partly to his own outlook. This is where the role of individual comes in. I'll give you one example. Between 1971 and 1975, they developed a massive working class movement in Tanzania, which Tanzania has not seen before. By 1971, it already adopted socialism, namely 67. Russian declaration. We had nationalized much of means of production. So we had a number of public sector companies. Workers started with strikes in both private as well as public enterprise. And they used as their slogan to mobilize themselves, the slogans given by the Arusha Declaration and Mongozo, Mongozo, another important document, document 1971, more militant than the Arusha Declaration. Now there's one clause in Mongozo, clause 15, which said that the For a Tanzanian leader, it must be forbidden to be arrogant, extravagant, and captious, and oppressed. And the workers used this against their management. The state party bureaucracy acted very harshly against the world. As it is, strikes are illegal. Still are. So workers moved, the movement moved very rapidly. You know, you know, when revolutions happened, they happened within days, right? They moved from strikes to what they call lockdowns or lockouts, meaning that they would lock out their manager. The lockout that you know traditionally is that management locks out workers, right? In this case, the workers locked out management. We will run the factory ourselves, but we don't want to see you. Because you're oppressed, you're arrogant, you're filtering away, you are corrupt. And they continue running the factory themselves. So when they found that they could run the factory without management, then obviously they lost to the state. So why do we need management at all? So that we can take it over factory. Until then. For three full years, Nehru had not come out in the public. Workers thought Mali was on our side. 1974, pressure otherwise, in a madness speech, Mali Muyarari harshly condemned work, saying, when you strike, 
against whom are your strength? Logic being the logic of all state bourgeoisies, that these belong to the workers. So your strike against yourself. But one person saying, no, they're not controlled by us. They're challenging the former ownership and putting forward the real relations that exist. So when that happened, of course, the bureaucratic management now became stronger more courageous. Workers were dismissed, force was used, and many were taken back to their homes. You know homes, the area they talk about. In, in Africa, we still talk about homes. You know? The cities are not for you. <laughs> you belong there. <laughs> Your homes. Now, it could well be argued that Bolivia could have made a choice. Some would argue, for example, the Molimu had no alternative, had no choice because he was the head of state. How could he tolerate strikes or work? He had to control. But others could well argue that, in fact, because he was head of the state and because he was popular, he could have made a choice. <coughs> he could have made a choice. If he had realized that here you have the constituents for the socialism that you want to be. But yeah, I did not make that choice. And that is why, and many people have asked why the title of book three is Rebellion Without Rebels. You see? Here is a social building of socialism as an individual crusade. He did not cultivate the constituents for workers and peasants. So when the crisis came, he had no one to stand by. His fellow leaders, who had all been seeking socialism, began turning against him. You see the argument? That's what happened. But he had made certain choices. The last part of my presentation is headed politics as pedagogy. And this is what I call, what did I personally, what, what is my takeaway from this project of writing William Moon's biography? And one thing I learned which really is at this stage more hypothesis. I hope you give the time to discuss this. That Nyerere's political practices, but what, what I describe is politics as pedagogy. Politics as pedagogy. If you listen to read the transcripts of Malimu's Israeli speeches, strength. Unlike his English speeches. His English speeches were meant for the foreign audience and very often they are drafted by her, by his personal assistant, Joan Wittem, okay? But his Israeli speeches, which all of them, okay? were extra, what do you call it? Ex, ex, they were not written now. All right? He made his notes in a scrap of paper of the Nyerere to give his speech. There's one anecdote. It says that whenever Malimu had to speak to people, to his speeches, and there was a kind of lunch before, before that occasion, he would not be able to eat. We became so nervous. Very interesting. The man who could speak for an hour without faltering. Before that, he would become nervous. 
Now, when, when he can't get speak, you know, and you listen to it, the people listen to it, at the end, you will you come back and feel, ah, I learned something. That's why we call it Tulipata Somo. Tulipata Somo. As if we were in a classroom, we learned. For him, the whole nation was his class. Now, that's a very different type of politics than the politics, political speeches that we are used to. You know, it's demagogy, populist speeches, harangues, and slogans, and so on. You know, it's what it is. So, in that case, I am arguing that, in fact, for Walimu, Politics was a terrain of pedagogy. It was a terrain of pedagogy, not simply power struggle. Meant to mobilize the rip up emotions of the people for the next election. Now, that doesn't mean there was no power struggle in the country. Of course, there is. But these struggles, it's another thing that one can talk about what we don't have time for. Took place within the party, behind the closed doors of the party. You know, we had one party system. We had one party system. And when he was to say later, and I don't think it was a simply uh, kind of second thought or after the fact uh, justification, that for him, taking on the one party system, establishing one party system was not a philosophical choice. It was a practical, pragmatic choice for two reasons. One, at the time, multi party would not have made sense in terms of anything. The Tan, the ruling party, was so overwhelmingly important. In the first election, no member from the opposition party was elected. All were Tan members. There was only one independent, but he was also a Tanu member. But when Tanu did not give him the ticket to stand, he stood independently and won the election. So opposition parties are very ministerial. So in real argument was the whole sense does it make to follow multi-party and follow the system of you know the parliamentary system of rapes and so on, because we want free debates in parliament. People should not be restricted by the real system. That was his one reason. Which is, one can discuss it. But the second reason, which I think is more plausible, he was saying in our situation, where our major task is to build the nation out of what he called tribes which have been left by colonials, we need national unity. We need to build national unity. And he was very consistent on national unity. And inevitably, if you allow a multi party system, these parties will become places of politicians to mobilize people based on ethnicity, race, parochial, okay, just to win power, regionalism, and so on. If that happens, then you will wreck the national project. That is the argument. Which second argument that is makes sense, makes sense. Because you have seen what is that previous argument. But in 1992, the same Hollywood who argued down to go multiply. Very interesting. And many people have wondered what happened. Of course, the politicians, the opposition politicians, oh, you see, he has realized his mistake. What the point? And we are suggesting we need three. And I think there is something that for Freddie want to reflect, very interesting, is that, you know, after he stepped down in 1985 from his presidency, Malimo went down whole country visiting party branches. 
And his ambition was to revitalize the party. The way he had done in 1962, when he had uh, designed the prime minister, I'm not sure. But as he went down, what did you find? He found his, his party had become highly bureaucratized. People are so critical of the party. Your party had lost touch with the people. In 87, his term finished, but he agreed to continue to be chairman of the party while we was the president. What are the three? In 1990, before his term, he resigned his term. By that time, he had realized that it was not possible to reorganize this party. This party had gone too far down the bureaucratic road. Do you know what he was hoping for? Of course, he could not say it in public. He was hoping that the ruling party would split. With multi party, the ruling party would split. It didn't it never happen. Because, because his successors knew without the machinery of the party, they could not win. He met an observation the Freddie McCormick's, and he fought Freddie McCormick's, talking precisely about to make sure that our party did not get alienated. It's a wonderful speech. He was talking to Freddie Moore, directing his remarks to Freddie Moore, but he was also thinking of his own party. You know, we should not lose that. I don't know if Freddie ever drew any lessons from that speech. It is very easy. That's why I said that for Freddie Moore, it could be interesting discussion. Anyway, so that's what happened. And we got multi party. Well, what we have in multi party and so on is not the subject of the biography, obviously. Although it's a reference to speak, but that's one of the occasions to discuss. So some of the things that we never had predicted actually are happening. And one of his last speeches was what he called Nufa, Nufa meaning cracks. They are already appearing cracks in your national edifice. Radicalism, you know, Islamism, racism, they are making a come. If they're not careful, they break this nation. He said it was the end of his life. Now, with some concluding remarks, I hope I'm not going to go my time. Uh, one thing that I've learned, I'm not a historian. I'm not a historian, not a politician, not a political scientist. And I'm a lawyer by training, but I'm this way to go. So, but in writing this uh, biography, it appears to me that biography can be an important genre of history of life. Mainstream history, I don't accept biography, have biography as a, as a genre of history. Some in fact totally rejected. For them, Biography means I talk about individuals, while they are talking about events, so no longer direct. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, my experience writing here is biography leads me to a different conclusion. My view is that writing a biography, particularly in our circumstance, if it's written, written critically, Using the method of historical materialism, it can let us interrogate history, while at the same time, bring out the role of individual in making it history. Very, very interesting philosophical questions arise. Right? The individual against collective struggle, freedom against necessity, voluntarism and determinism, you know, all these issues. How do we handle it? Right. 
For example, personally, I learned a great deal about the history of the Russian Revolution. The richest Bible, of course, the Kingdom. And the richest Bible of first time. If you're not ready, please read it. It's uh, excellent. I think that's a lot more. And uh, C.L.R. James, Black Jekyll. The father of the Amazing. So I end by making more to say the biography constitutes an exciting genre of historiography, which African and global South historians or others can very well employ to both understand their history, but also, and this is very important, but also communicate that understanding to a popular leadership. Now, Biographies of our leaders, not only first generation nationalists, but even other leaders, colonial people, and they don't exist a lot. Of course, biographies of some well known persons are written, but usually they're written by foreigners. Usually they're written by foreigners, right? Including Mandela. That's what I was talking with Patricia. He said, Isn't there a bag of Omika Cabra? Come and go And she doesn't bury it. Mario the Andrade wrote a biography of Cabra, but in French. Another person wrote it Portuguese. Another bloody division of the continent in terms of language, Anglo, Russo. We don't communicate. I mean, a poor fellow like me who doesn't read French, you don't know that the biography of Cabral existed. I don't know how to do it. And you have to work on You have to work on So it's another issue that we have to take into account when you write this. But I then look forward to our discussions here and explore in my view. It is new ground, writing, writing Bible, and confronting all the important issues of history and politics, you know, philosophy. And hopefully, to get for us level of our own theoretical friends, for those of us who will be agonizing or what has happened to our universe, how we have become appendages of what our friends and others used to call. We become some kind of hunters and gatherers to gather data, you know, not to process them, processing papers elsewhere. And then comes back to us as theory. We are not capable of producing theory. Yes? It's true. It's true. Read your PhDs, what your young people do. Okay? First, you will not find a theoretical, theoretical framework, but you find it, it will take up from somewhere else. At length. Why can't we produce our own theory? Theory is the highest form of knowledge. And just reduce ourselves to simply get us of that. We will process that. Just really remarks, thank you very much. It should be a copy break now, but this is a keynote. Uh, unless you have questions, because basically the old symposium is dedicated to address some of the issues, some of the issues that is raised. Let me see if the copy uh, has a mind. But meanwhile, please <laughs> let me hear from you. <laughs> let me. I'll hear from them while you're looking for yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> hey, Take your time, take your time. Don't be there. I would really love to hear your reactions.
Yes, please. Uh, thank you. I have, I have a question, which is okay. We do have this biography of uh, but my question is how a person who was fighting for liberty is uh, people's power, why he did invade or help to invade the Sansibar. And yes, still yes. today, Sansibar is. Uh, there is a big problem with uh, the Zanzibar in terms of human rights. So there is no coffee yet. Integration <laughs> into uh, 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 What uh, I haven't been many times to Tanzania, but I have been in some of the places. And what has marked me very much is Yerere. I was lost in uh, Dar es Salaam uh, one morning, waiting for a team went to the volume. To meeting to with the near area, but the time doesn't connect. And I was walking in town. A policeman comes to me and says, Are you from Mozambique? Yes, do I go to the president's office? I arrived there, and the secretary was at the, the sandals. I left his sandals and went to tell the near area that I, they had found me. So I go in and he says to me, You are a lucky man because you are lost. In my town, and I'm the president because if Samora caught you like that, you would be jailed. <laughs> and I was in I really, it was very, very, you know, for me, I was very young at the time, but it was something very, he was near you, and he was a normal person. But at the same time, there is a history of oppression and which goes on, and also the question of the villages, which was, uh, I don't think it was a Tanzanian uh, export to Mozambique, but the villagization program in Mozambique has been a disaster, and I think that it was similar in Tanzania. Probably there are differences, etc. But so these two aspects are really important. The third is that he created uh, the Tanzanian politics, created a space for Portuguese support, uh, a counter revolutionary support from the Portuguese state against Tanzania. I can't remember now the names of the parties, but there is a group of people from Zanzibar, especially, and also from Tanzania. Oscar Cambona in the south, but the people in, in Zanzibar also were used or were part of some political projects by the Portuguese. And still today, we have a problem with the Zanzibar uh, power in the Indian Ocean from Zanzibar up to the Mozambique Island. And there is something which we are not very clear about. How this Mashabab and so on navigate in between these areas. I'm sure they navigate from Musimwe, etc., to Zanzibar, selling uh, crayfish, etc., and they navigate from Zanzibar up to the UAE. There is a lot of even potatoes go from uh, Tanzania to Zanzibar and from Zanzibar to Zimbabwe. At least when I, I did study this, there were evidence about it. So I, I think that there are some of these aspects which don't uh, match uh, with the personality of, of, and uh, the politics of Nehem. So I would like to learn more to do about it. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> let me quickly try to say something. What is the sensible question? The Zanzibar issue is not simple. Tanganyika never invaded Zanzibar. Never invaded Zanzibar. Yeah. Uh, as you know, Zanzibar bought its Lancaster House type of independence in 1963. With a constitutional monarchy yeah, based on the British structure. But uh, the Sultan had a bit more powers than the monarchy. And it was seen by the large population 
is essentially imposing an Arab dynasty on Zanzibar. Okay. This was 1963. And only a few months later, we were the revolution. Now, in the revolution, there's a lot of written. I had an evoke on Africanism or pragmatism. Lessons of Tangani Kazan's Bible, which you know. The insurrection, it was much more of an insurrection rather than a revolution, was actually led by the ASP youth, a semi literate group of people. Okay? It's only later on the Uma part, which was headed by Abdul Rahman Muhammad a left person, okay? and very well trained, which came in and tried to introduce some order. Now, during the revolution, it is true there was killing. Right? And people, it's happening regularly. People with pent up grievances, where they have been treated, so, you know, take this out. Right? In Russia, I remember, this, they went on drinking spree and killing and so on. And cross came to make an order that all the barrels of vodka should be simply spilled in the streets. So revenge killing happened. That's the Indian rule of no doubt. But more important, don't forget, 1964 is coming after Congo and after the Cuban crisis, missile crisis in 62, all right? And the West, there's a lot of evidence now. The, the Americans and the British very concerned that right in the Indian Ocean, you would have another communist act. Right? So they wanted by hook or crook. Number two, the mainland countries. Tanganyika, Kenya, Uganda, also were affected. Mind you, Sikhiko Yara is still a moderate, not a militant. And this preoccupation of him, how does he survive? How does the independence of Tanganyika survive in this Cold War? He did not want Cold War, Cold War at his doorstep. So what does he do? That's why I say there's no pragmatic On Karumi's part, he was heavy, he was the president of the People's Republic of Zanzibar. Karumi wanted to get rid of the left from his government. People like Babu and others. Why? Because he saw them as a threat. So those were the practical issues which resulted in the ruin. The union was hurriedly put together. And until the last moment, Jare was hoping Uganda had already backstepped from, from the question of federation, Eastern Federation. He was hoping that Kenya would be part of the union, part of the federation. Zanzibar, Tanganyika, and Kenya. Until the last moment, Yarare said of Kamona, who was a foreign minister, Kenyatta, to ask him for his decision, Kenyatta said no. That is when now that was signed by us. Initially, there was pressure of America on, on Kenyatta. So why don't you take the Zira in your fault? Kenyatta said, no, no, I don't want to. I have enough Arabs on my coast. I don't want to take another group. That's how you need it. And the repression that you're talking about, of course, soon after that, Karun Fakur didn't mean it. People don't know that. Karun Fakur didn't mean it. No, no respect to him. Again, he bent on considering his power and became a tyrant. He changed the time. No, the repression that he said to the people that was killing for his own government. And then he told them, in fact, 
Then now you can identify any of you are killing Arabs. But tomorrow and day after, we start killing each other. That's exactly what happens in Zanzibar. So that story, first of all, that, that as a matter of fact, after Karun was assassinated, you became into power and they merged the party, official department, and the main part of the national union to form CCM. There was no opening up in Zanzibar. Then we could go. The story about Zanzibar's grievances and so on are, are real. Are real. And that discussion is going to be more and more. That's not going to get the discussion. Villainization. I, I agree with you. That was the greatest possible mistake. Yeah. Forced villainization. Forced villainization. People put it in and somehow he was pushed by zealots in the party. He himself became impatient. All right. Besides everything else, he alienated his present constituents. He alienated his present constituents for that. And that's why I said that through this forced immunization, lost his present constituency, through repressing workers, 71, 74, he and then when the crisis came in the 80s, they were doing it. They were not considered quite for That's what happened. On the question of, I don't know about Mozambique, uh, whether they copied this from Tanzania or they copied it from Soviet Union, but I would read the little I know. Mozambique and Memphis are harsh. <laughs> Let me say, you know what surprises 